<laughs> there was a little delay there. Welcome back, everyone. Yeah, Welcome was, back was... to Matt. Go ahead, Seth. No, no, no. Having my a thing's phone. having a little delay, too. Keep going. I think we're, as you can see, we're having a lot of technical issues, not because of technology, but because of our excitement of, of our today's guest. And I think that <laughs> he, he needs no introduction. He's kind of the architect of the UBI program, and he explains it, I think, the best that, um, in my opinion, the best that has been articulated. Um, uh, and I think that you guys are going to get a lot from this show. Um, UBI is a, very, a platform that I've kind of put my flag on um, in my campaign and many campaigns and many progressive campaigns put their flags on UBI because we believe that that's the way of the future. And so I look forward to this show. This is going to be a great show. Where we, you know, we're going to get some great dialogue. Um, but I'm, so I'm going to not kill the time here and with a long intro. And I'm going to have Seth introduce himself like always. And I'm going to ask Scott. Great. Thanks, Jesse. Yep. Go ahead, Seth. Tell the people who right, Hopefully are. there's not too much delay here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Very good, man. There's already some delay. <laughs> Anyways, I'll just speak as if there's not delay. Sure. Uh, I've followed you for like years. And, you know, you've always been a big proponent of UBI. I know that you're somewhat affiliated with the Andrew Yang campaign. I'm not 100% sure what your role was. All I know is 2020, me and Jesse were both, Andrew Yang, been along the ride with you this whole time. So it's pretty surreal to be talking to you too right now. Uh, explain what, what what were you doing for Andrew Yang, like helping promote UBI? What was your role with him? Yeah, I was like an unofficial advisor to Andrew. I mean, I was a friend of his since before the campaign. Um, you know, we met... Uh, a couple like a year before he started his campaign and uh yeah i was just excited to uh you know that first conversation that we uh not our first conversation but when we talked about how he was actually going to run for president and i was very excited about that and just thinking like how great that would be just to make it to the first debate and like be able to like see the entire crew of people on the stage uh be like debating base gang column and uh, staking their uh, either support or uh, being against it and talking about it. I was just, that was like, I was really excited about. So it far exceeded my expectations to see him uh, do as well as he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did well. And I think that he got the conversation going, um, in my opinion, for what I've seen a lot with UBI is, um, kind of like test runs. Even I, I I say this all the time. I believe that the stimulus packages that was passed recently in these last couple of years was kind of that test run for UBI. What are some of your thoughts on that um, stimulus packages that passed and some of the effects of those packages? Yeah, I, I really do uh, think that just the timing of the pandemic, uh, how quickly that followed Andrew's campaign uh, I think that there's like there's definitely a lot of influence on the response that we did. I think through just the freshness of that campaign, it was like a lot of people that was on their mind uh, when the um, when everything went down with with the pandemic. Uh, I, I think that there was just it was top of mind for people to be thinking, "Hey, what really we need to get money to people," and uh, so I think that that was. That was really helpful. Uh, I think that just the the response there's 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 a lot of things that we can take away from what we did, and uh, there's a lot of things that we I, I don't think should be taken away from it. And uh, so, like on the one hand, uh, I, I think we did, we did a great job compared to like the Great Recession um, and how we responded to this crisis. And um, and then I think it's unfortunate that, you know, in, in the impact that the pandemic had led to inflation that Putin ended up invading Ukraine that that worsened the inflation and exacerbated it and that uh, that people look back and and think, oh, well, we have inflation and oh, that we did this stuff during the pandemic and therefore 
uh, one caused the other and that, oh, this is evidence against basic income where, you know, there's a lot of, I think, important discussion to be had about what we did and how it was different from basic income and how it was kind of similar to basic income and also what we can take away from what really caused inflation and how we could have avoided as much inflation and like how we can actually apply that to any kind of basic income policy. Uh, uh, so, sorry. So uh, as we can see here, um, it, it's one of those things where I think that, um, you know, we never, like you said, the, the tentacles of what essentially Andrew Yang started, we never knew the effect of what, what would, of what it would really be. Um, one of the things that, you know, that I find exciting about UBI is the fact that it replaces a lot of um, pre-existing pre programs that has a lot of red tape to mm -hmm. and, and removes the benefits for most people <clears throat> because they have to do that red tape. And UBI is kind of this concept, and you can explain in more detail, that it essentially removes that red tape and just makes everyone have a, you know, a fair playing field. Yeah, on that. Yeah, I suppose that we should actually just make sure everyone knows to what we're talking about by just defining basic income for everyone. Maybe not everyone is totally familiar and and what is uh, what really like qualifies as basic income. So I'd say that the definition of basic income according to the Basic Income Earth Network, which was the international organization that was founded decades ago around this topic. Um, it's a periodic cash payment unconditionally delivered to all on an individual basis without means test or work requirement. So there's five characteristics that it needs to be cash, universally provided, unconditional, to individuals, and periodically provided uh, on like a regular ongoing basis. So yeah, we, there's, there's definitely, I think, a need to uh, replace certain programs and adjust certain other programs, keep certain programs. There's a, a lot of nuance there too. Uh, but I think as a good example uh, of this and also uh, related to, to what we're talking about with the pandemic and kind of lessons to take away, uh, what we did during the pandemic, uh, one of the things we did was we boosted unemployment. And so we just straight away, we did a $600 per week uh, boost flat across the board across all states. And um, that was, of course, $2,400 per month. And uh, that was an unemployment program. So you only got that if you were unemployed. So we created this situation during the pandemic where, you know, we're talking about the importance of these essential workers and a lot of the unessential workers, quote unquote, you know, were able to, um, you know, stay home. And those unessential workers got like at least $2,400 per month. And that was in addition to the state unemployment uh, income. So people were getting like potentially three or $4,000 per month. And you had essential workers who did not get that program. And they have med may have just been earning like, you know, $1,500 per month. So I thought that was pretty messed up and I wanted to avoid that. And so I was pushing for monthly stimulus payments. Mm -hmm. And if we had done that, then, you know, the monthly stimulus would have boosted unemployment, uh, this, this, the state unemployment programs, but also it would have boosted the essential workers too. And that's really the important difference between an, a program like unemployment and a program like basic income where unemployment potentially creates this incentive structure where you're worse off employed. And of course, people confuse that with basic income. And, you know, they say basic income was paying people not to work. It's paying people to do nothing. And basically I'm actually paying people to do anything. You know, they're, they're, it, it is not lost with employment. It always adds to it. So you're always better off with basic income, increasing your income through employment um, versus a program like unemployment where that's not the case. And that's the same thing is true with the traditional welfare system where these various programs have either cliff effects or phase outs that equivocate to, you know, high marginal tax rates. Yeah. I mean that, and that's like you say, it's to try to kind of 
create a system as possible, you know, as, as much as we can, where in, inequalities are essentially removed from it, right? I think that's the basic premise behind, you know, UBI. So what are some case studies and from your knowledge that has shown the success rate of UBI in other countries? Yeah, when I first got into the topic of, of basic income, when I first really started exploring this idea, it was back in 2013. And it was diving into the the evidence from various pilots that I just really found the most fascinating. You know, my background is in uh, psychology, and I've always, you know, really loved science. And, you know, to see the scientific data, um, it was just fascinating to me, both the history of it and the actual results from these programs. I had no idea uh, back then that we were so close to having some kind of basic income program uh, under Richard Nixon. You know, this is, he proposed uh, the family assistance plan in 1969, and it ended up passing the House twice and not making it through the Senate to be, you know, reach his desk to be signed into law. But it would have provided a guaranteed <clears throat> basic income to all families in the US. So it would have dramatically reduced poverty. And um, as, a res as, a, as part of that uh, uh, program that was almost implemented, we actually had a lot of pilots back then too. And so there were a series of pilots. Uh, the first one was in New Jersey and uh, the biggest one was in Seattle and Denver. It also did Gary, Indiana, uh, rural North Carolina. Um, they had these various pilots around the country and, um, this was testing like a, what's called a negative income tax design. So this uses a phase out rate. And so they were testing both the, uh, various amounts of basic income guarantee and also, um, the various amounts of phase out rates. So like maybe one pilot had, was testing a 50% phase out rate and a 70% phase out rate and a 30% phase out rate to see what were the differences to how it would impact um, the work incentive. And same thing with, with the amounts too. You know, there's going to be a larger disincentive um, with a larger amount versus a smaller amount. So this was really, it's really the only thing I cared about too. It wasn't really looking at anything else, but we still did learn some other things from this. So first of all, um, there are, was not any significant impact at all on uh, primary earning males. Uh, again, this is the 1970s. And um, the largest impact on them was that they tended to um, spend a little bit longer between jobs looking for the next job. And that's actually, I think, a good impact. So even if you see slightly less employment per year, like they saw with that, uh, you also see like better job matching, you know, better skills matching mm -hmm. to jobs. You don't want people just to take the very first job that's offered um, just because they have to, because they're desperate. You want them to be able to actually find the job that's best for them. And that seemed to be mm -hmm. what it was doing then. Uh, the only significant uh, employment decreases were mostly in uh, students and with uh, new mothers. And of course, both of those I consider to be forms of unpaid work and, you know, not some example of, oh, people are quitting their jobs at McDonald's, you know, to be lazy. Like, no, they're actually investing in their future incomes and they're investing in their families um, yeah. by focusing on on that work that we don't recognize well enough as valuable work. So it just shows the... Uh like the conservative instinct that you know, poor people have to suffer in order to get something that they are successful in or something like that. And I just think that's a completely unnecessary aspect of the job force. I mean, I think something you said was really important is like proper job placements because the system that we have right now has basically coerced people into to picking jobs that don't suit or survive. And I don't find that very efficient or even a moral thing. It's not like we need yeah. McDonald's employees. We've seen to audit their service. So I don't see why automation is a problem as long as people are still getting by and we have enough resources.
resources to spread around equitably. And so the people invest in things that are more a skill set, not just menial tasks. So I think more people in, in careers is a better thing than, you know, useless jobs. Yeah, it basic income really empowers workers uh, to a degree that, of course, we've never seen before. And I think that's one of the main oppositions, one of the reason, reasons behind the opposition to this idea. It was actually one of the reasons why uh, the bill that Nixon was trying to get through the Senate never did, because the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, Russell Long, uh, actually believed uh, one of his quotes was, who will press my shirts? You know, he was concerned that that you wouldn't be able to find this cheap labor, this cheap labor that he could enjoy. And that was, you know, this exploitable workforce. So this 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 worry that people won't work if they're provided a basic income, you know, it doesn't come, it's not really about people not working at all. It's that they can withhold their labor until their demands are met. It's essentially like an individual mm -hmm. strike power. And so therefore it strengthens yeah. unions too, uh, but also it just strengthens the individual's power. And, you know, we saw a little bit of that too during the pandemic. Like that is something we saw this increased bargaining power thanks to the stimulus payments. And people were able to actually, you know, uh, switch jobs to something they would prefer. Um, mm -hmm. And this like concern that, oh, no one wants to work anymore. Like every time you hear that, it's, it's really no one wants to work anymore at the price of you know wages that they're looking mm -hmm. to do, um, it's not that people don't want to work at all. It's that hey, you know, if you raise your, if you pay me uh, twenty dollars an hour, um, I'll be happy to work for you. Uh, but if you're only going to pay me eight dollars an hour, no, I, I, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but right now, they don't really have a choice in the matter, which is why um, you know, the, for people who have a great interest in extremely cheap labor they may not be interested in basic income. But on the flip side, uh, it does actually subsidize the jobs that underpay people that people really would like to do. So, you know, there's people right now who would who were a teacher or maybe they would like to be a teacher. But being a teacher maybe doesn't really pay that uh, much at all in, you know, where are you living? And so uh, if you're looking at, $30,000 a year as a teacher versus $50,000 a year doing something else that you wouldn't really like to do as much as being a teacher, uh, a basic income of, you know, say $15,000 a year or something that changes that equation. Like you can actually uh, say, okay, I'll take the $30,000 job teaching because I know I'll be getting paid $45,000 total. And so I can actually do that now. And so not only does it provide power, bargaining power, to say no to jobs you don't want to do, but actually provides the freedom to say yes to the jobs that you would like to do. I mean, that's the point. I think you make a really good point there. <laughs> sorry, sorry, we are delay again. Uh, but yeah, I think that the the market capitalist system has a way of creating you know inefficiency because it only creates jobs versus their profitability. And I think there's a lot of roles in society that are really, really important that aren't very profitable. And I, you know, a, a more effective system would be something where it's like you can survive and make good money and also do something effectively that helps society. There's so many jobs that are just, you know, pointless, absolutely pointless that earn profit and that could be easily removed from society without a blink of an eye and we can replace those with, with jobs that actually help society more social workers more teachers more this and that stuff that can actually improve personal lives that don't necessarily you know give you the re financial returns that you need to survive so you know yeah. more more but this is what economic freedom is did you read not, uh you know did you read bullshit jobs by david graber so we're talking about books earlier before we even started this that is that a book that either of you or both of you have read I've I've heard of that. I've not read. It. I, I saw the part that you wrote about it in your book, the bullshit jobs yeah. part. I mean, but. it's it's it, you're basically describing it. Uh, this this notion that that yeah. we've generated a bunch of jobs that are entirely unnecessary. You know, and what is the impact of mm -hmm. that on our productivity? Um, you know, what is the impact of that on our mental health? Uh, no one wants to be in a job that they themselves know is useless, and 
you know, if, if that job were to be eliminated, that like it would impact nobody. No one wants to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just, it's a huge productivity suck. Like, uh, the amount of resources that we're doing is just, is terrible. So yeah, if we can, as, as David Graeber proposed, like he, in this book, he describes it all and then it ends with the prescription and the prescription is basic income. You know, there's, there's no other policy that would be as effective at eliminating unnecessary jobs as making sure that people can refuse to do unnecessary jobs and can instead choose to do what they think is valuable. And that's also one of the uh, results of the pilots that I see over and over and over again that really caught my eye even back when I first got into this, which is just the impact that it has consistently on entrepreneurship. Uh, in the Namibia UBI pilot, um, that was an entire village, this was a fully universal saturation site, uh, that increased entrepreneurship by 301%. So we're looking at like a, a quadrupling of people starting their own businesses because mm -hmm. of this. And you know that's just a, a statistic but um, the, uh, there's a great story from that pilot that I love to tell because it illustrates it so well and illustrates why basic income is so much better at entrepreneurship uh, than any other um, program. And so what happened was during the, the first payment, uh, this woman uh, went out and used her first payment to buy a bunch of flour and yeast and she uh, created like a makeshift oven and she started baking these small uh, mini loaves uh, to sell to those in her, in her, in her village. And it was very popular. Uh, she did really well. And, you know, by the end of this pilot, she was working, uh, she was earning, I believe it was three times or four times um, the amount of the basic income on top of her basic income. And you can imagine like if, let's say if she just gotten a loan or even just a grant, then she could have done the same thing, but what were her customers have been? You know, because basic income was provided to the entire village, then everyone had the ability to actually purchase those loaves from her. Whereas maybe without that, perhaps only a few people would have. Um, maybe the per the business wouldn't even have have worked out if um, if no one else in the village had received the money. But because everyone did, that became a very successful business. And, you know, just imagine that on like this, on a fully universal, you know, national scale, just how many people would start up new businesses and also how many of those businesses would actually succeed that otherwise wouldn't, you know, how many businesses have failed over the years that were actually a good idea and it was doing good stuff and people actually wanted that good or service, uh, but it failed because there was the inability uh, for people to actually buy it. So it's actually very market improving. Like if you're a capitalist and you want uh, an efficient market, not only does it make this like the, the labor market, like a free market for labor, but it also makes sure that businesses um, can actually, you know, see demand that people actually are able to signal their demand. Uh, it's like voting in markets. It's, a, it's yeah. like handing out ballots uh, for people to vote on what it is that they want um, without basic income. You can't really do that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's very spot on. I mean, when you talk about the <clears throat> the economic growth is the most important aspect of it. My biggest thing is to how to how we use it, UBI to increase. Um, I believe in we have social classes, and I believe that UBI would essentially send people from certain social classes to the other because it would give them a base income um, in terms of being able to at least, like you said, invest in their futures and give them an opportunity to do what they actually like to do. Um, I guess my biggest thing is that you said, like, you know, most people, the biggest concern is how do you pay for it, right? Um, so what are some of your ideas that you think that essentially the government can do to pay for it? Yeah, whenever I'm asked that question, the, the first thing I like to answer with is just asking, um, you know, what are we paying right now for the lack of basic income? You know, what is the, what's the full cost of poverty? What's the full cost of high inequality? What's the full cost of chronic mass insecurity? 
these things actually carry cost. It's not free. Um, you know, we're actually paying a lot more than we otherwise would be uh, on these downstream impacts. Uh, as one example that's been calculated in the U.S., we're spending over $1 trillion a year on child poverty alone. And we could completely you know, re reduce that uh, to zero if we wanted to uh, through a basic income. And the, uh, like the, again, one of the, one of the programs that we did during the pandemic that we could learn from was the enhanced child tax credit that cut child poverty uh, by about 40%. And then when it expired, child poverty more than doubled as a result. So the calculation of um, the estimate of, of the ROI on if we had actually made that program permanent would be uh, was ten dollars per one dollar. So we're it would have cost a hundred billion dollars a year, and um, here we are spending a trillion dollars per year on child poverty. It, it makes no sense to do that. Um, one of the impacts that was seen from the uh, from the Dauphin pilot in Canada in the 1970s was uh, a reduction in hospitalization rates by 8.5 percent, and we see that uh, repeatedly in terms of better both physical, mental, physical and mental health. And if we if we connect that to what we're paying on Medicare, Medicaid, and our health insurance premiums, then with basic income, we should see a significant reduction in those. And when it comes to crime, same kind of thing. In the Namibia UBI pilot, crime was reduced by over 42%. And in the Dauphin saturation pilot in the 1970s, uh, overall crime went down by 15%, and violent crime went down by 37%. So we should see some amount of, of significant crime reduction. What are we spending on that? You know, we'll, we'll put someone in prison and we'll spend fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year to keep someone incarcerated. And mm -hmm. what we don't want to do, we think it's too expensive to actually pay for, you know, fifteen thousand dollars a year in basic income. Um, then yeah. they exit prison. Recidivism rates are ridiculous. You know, we're looking at five year recidivism rate at something like seventy or eighty percent. And uh, one of the recent pilots there's a couple of recent pilots that are actually focused on those recently incarcerated to see what the recidivism rate difference is and the one year recidivism rate difference in um, one of these pilots is zero percent so zero of the participants went back to prison within that year thanks to having a basic income and so how much money will we save via that via a dramatically lower recidivism rate so I just want people to make sure that you're thinking from the holistic perspective when we ask how much does this cost, um, how much are we paying for this? Like it's not free to not do a basic income. So that's main point. Um, but then aside from that, there's there's a lot of things that we're already doing that we can convert to a basic income. You know, there, that doesn't mean that we should get rid of everything. It just yeah. means that there's some programs that we're doing that would make more sense as a basic income. Uh, I think mm -hmm. a prime example of that is is the TANF program. That's a block grant program to states, and then states end up using a bunch of that money not for those things. Uh, they don't end up. It's, it's it's meant to be a cash program for families in poverty, and instead, it's really not that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's I think a key program that uh, I think would be great to replace. But then there's other programs like, say, uh, you know, disability supports. Um, I think that's a program that should be additional to basic income, but also it would need to be as large. So, you know, if right mm -hmm. now uh, someone receives $900 per month on SSI uh, as the maximum, you know, that could be potentially five or 600 or something. And then that would be additional to, say, you know, a $1,300 per month basic income or whatever, in which case they would go from, you know, 900 max now to something like uh, 1900. And then you'll be in a far better place, but we're actually still spending less on disability than we were before, thanks to having this mm -hmm. floor underneath everybody. And then there's programs that are tech subsidies that we tend to, you know, not even discuss or not think of as, you know, welfare programs, but they're really welfare programs for the middle class. They're welfare programs for the rich. Uh, these tax expenditures yeah. are 
are disproportionately provided to a large degree to those with high income to the point that like the average uh, amount of the for the top one percent is over uh ten thousand dollars per month you know this is a very large subsidy that we provide um to those to the rich in total it's over 1.5 trillion dollars a year in tax expenditures so again it's not like we have to get we can get rid of all of those but there are certain tax mm -hmm. expenditures that we can get rid of something like the standard deduction you know that costs around 300 billion dollars per year that's entirely unnecessary with the basic income so there's a lot of these things that we can subtract from the cost and um, then there's also understanding the net cost versus the gross cost the gross cost that people need to understand which is um, that the cost of basic income is not the amount of ubi multiplied by the number of people that it's going to yeah uh, because if you are someone who's let's say paying twelve thousand dollars in additional taxes that are new uh, and you're receiving twelve thousand dollars a year in basic income that's a net zero you know the government isn't providing yeah. anything and you're not paying anything so you have to figure out the net for every single person and that's the cost of a basic income is that net amount so it's much smaller it's usually around you know depending on the details let's say on average it's uh, around a third of the gross cost so combine all those things together and you're looking at spending less than $1 trillion on net for a program that will uh, end up having an ROI of larger than a trillion dollars per year. Mm -hmm. There's not even right. just the, uh, the actual programs that you cut to. You also think about the problems that you solve that cost a lot of money, like the homelessness crisis. And you think about mm -hmm. how many million, hundreds of millions of dollars they're spent in California every year on these think tanks and these certain means tested programs and social or public housing projects that are, that don't need to be necessary if we didn't have a homelessness crisis. If we if people just could afford to take care of themselves because of the money that we're you know distributing. Then they could solve the issue on their own. They could get their own apartment. We don't have to have this uh, the sum of public housing and this backlog, uh, all this sort of stuff that's just preventing people from living their lives. Like it's it's an easily solvable issue. We could literally just pool all that yeah. kind of money together and pour it into distributing, and then the, the problem is solved. And then yeah, uh, not only is basic income right. highly effective for homelessness, but it's also a prevention mechanism. And that's what we're absolutely yeah. not doing right now. Like we're really waiting until yeah. people are actually homeless and then we try to treat that and we're terrible at it. It's hugely mm -hmm. expensive, but it, it, it's a, um, it, there's a, a study done that looked at that you could prevent like a significant amount of homelessness by just making sure that someone gets $1,000 right like at the time where they need it. Yeah. And if we can prevent all of that with just that small amount, um, that's a huge ROI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what, go ahead, Seth. Uh, I was just going to say, what do you think about um, ideas such as like land value tax or like a social wealth fund in terms of like a means to distribute the, the basic income? Yeah, I love land value taxes. Um, I, I think it's it, like like Milton Friedman said. Uh, you know, it was it, it was his favorite tax. He called he referred to it as the 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 least bad tax. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I don't think of taxes to the same way that Milton Friedman did, uh, but I do think like the the incentives um, are are much better with a land value tax because you're really looking at uh, taxing something that's entirely unproductive activity mm -hmm. um, and at the same time encouraging uh, greater housing supply and therefore reducing rents uh, you mm -hmm. know like if housing should be more affordable and if we can actually do a tax that makes housing more affordable then not only are you uh, helping manage inflation through this tax but you're also um, you know, it's a two birds and one with one stone kind of kind of policy. Uh, land value tax and any universal basic income, I think, work great together. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, I guess for those people who don't necessarily know, well, maybe what that is too. A lot of people confuse an LVT with a property tax. Um, mm -hmm. But the difference between a land value tax and a property tax is that a property tax taxes uh, mostly what's built on top of the land, and a land value tax taxes 
the land itself, that value and not what's built on it. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you have like a skyscraper next to an, a vacant lot next to it and they're both the same size, then both of those owners of those lots will pay the same tax, in which yeah. case, you know, it's a benefit to the one with the skyscraper and re it's rewarding them. Like that is a great use of land. Whereas yeah. this big vacant lot, someone's just waiting. They're unproductively hoping for a giant windfall that they don't, they don't deserve. They, you know, they did nothing mm -hmm. to actually gain this windfall. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as someone who, who, who used to live in, in New Orleans, um, I consider that uh, my home for you know, over 10 years, uh, I just constantly saw all these houses, even post Katrina, that were still just sitting there post Katrina, and you know, eventually people would sell them, and again, this massive windfall. They didn't do anything; they just waited, and paid very little property tax for a long time, and then boom, sold it uh, for someone else to to develop. And you know, that should be discouraged, and you can't do that with a, a land value tax. Um, but another thing I, I just want to mention too is, is, um, and this is what I get to in my, in my book that, uh, the, like we need to properly see taxes and, and government spending and the order of those events. And we mm -hmm. actually, that was another lesson to take too from the pandemic and what we did, which is that we did not tax first in order to spend anything. We did not issue treasury securities and quote, you know, take on debt first in order to spend. Mm -hmm. We just issued that currency because that's what we can do. And that's what mm -hmm. we always do. Like all government spending is just issued currency. And then taxation is what deletes that. And so it's it's taxation that helps manage inflation. So once you once you break out of that standard paradigm of taxing in order to spend and instead realize that we spend and then we tax in order to manage inflation, then we look at this in a, in a better way. And, you know, then we're looking at what's the best way to tax? Like what is, um, is income tax the best way to tax or is it something like land value tax? Uh, is yeah. it something like a small transaction tax on every transaction? Uh, something like a carbon tax, you know, again, that's a two birds, one stone kind of policy where you're actually uh, reducing greenhouse gas, gas emissions at the same time as helping, you know, delete money from the money supply to manage inflation. So, Mm -hmm. I think it, understanding that helps us think what, you know, what is our true limit? It's not money. Like money is not this, this thing that we dig up out of the ground and we have to yeah. like, dig up enough of yeah. it in order to spend it. Uh, we just create it. And so therefore what really matters is our economic capacity to meet demand. Mm -hmm. You know, do we have the resources, the technology, the, uh, the skilled workers, the, um, the actual ability to meet the demand that 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 is expressed through people having and spending money and then we also know that there are policies that help manage inflation that aren't even taxes um, you know something like a yimby policy is also something in, in addition to lvt that i think is great because that helps increase the housing supply so if you just make sure that people can build multi-family homes instead of single family homes that helps reduce rent. And so therefore that also helps manage inflation without raising taxes. For those who don't well, know, you, Yimby is yes yeah. in my backyard. That's what Jesse was asking. Yes in my backyard. Right. So it'd be like a, a NIMBY and not in my backyard would be a kind of person that's, you know, maybe more liberal, but then opposed to development in their neighborhood, low housing uh, units, stuff like that, stuff that reduces the property value of their homes. So that's what <laughs> that's what he was referring to i have one i have a a, a way I, i'd like to take this uh let's talk about like inflation because that is the number one drawback for a lot of people when it comes to ubis misunderstanding how inflation happens because a lot mm -hmm. of people think that you put money into the economy prices go up when really inflation is more a response to supply and demand you know what i mean if it increased personal purchasing power for individuals in certain sectors and certain ways they're spending more money is going to increase the prices. So there's the, that's the kind of thing I think that you talked about in your book that I'd like to, uh, people really need to understand inflation. That's yeah, absolutely. Where I'm headed with this. So again, 
we need to it's it's great to to get the proper lessons from what we just did during the pandemic and the proper lessons that people should take away is that what what really caused inflation was that we witnessed a global pandemic which really constrained global supply lines and thus the ability to meet demand and that spiked inflation. It, 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 another part of it was that because the shutdowns, um, you know, there people spend on goods and services, and we shut down services. So people had money, and they still wanted to spend it. Uh, so they spent it on goods. So like the demand for goods went up more than usual, because the demand for services went greatly down. And so mm -hmm. therefore, not only do we have uh, global supply issues, but then we had higher demand for goods, um, which worsened those global supply chain issues. And that's also why we saw inflation all around the world. Like this wasn't just in the US. And it also, you saw this in countries, you know, regardless of how much, uh, you know, stimulus or whatever that they did. So that's another, um, that's another lesson to take away. Uh, and then Putin invaded Ukraine. And so then you got, um, you know, pressure from oil. And oil is something that, you know, passes through to a lot of other prices. You know, the price of food will go up if the price of oil goes up because then the price of transportation goes up. So that didn't help at all. And then the, the third major factor through what we just recently saw for inflation and that what we're still seeing is that um, we saw a lot of seller's inflation. So this is that the environment of actual inflation from reduced ability to meet supply um, uh, meant that um, sellers were able to hike, hike their prices up beyond what was even necessary. So we were seeing a lot of record profits as a result of this, like they they had the cover of existing inflation to increase and exacerbate and lengthen inflation. So it's important to realize because we also this is something that I wanted us to do during the pandemic is that I wanted us to do some kind of windfall tax or excess profits tax. This is something that we see during wartime um, when you'll see people try mm -hmm. to hike up prices in order to take advantage of that. And this was a you know temporary emergency. We should have done the same thing. We should have treated it like a war against a virus to prevent anyone from enjoying mm -hmm. record profits. And you know, so that's the kind of tax that it's not meant to revenue raise. It's meant to discourage corporations from hiking prices because they know that if they do that, they're just going to lose out on those profits anyway. So why bother? Um, that's the kind of tax that could have helped mm -hmm. manage inflation. So. Those are some good takeaways. Uh, people should know too that the Federal Reserve, um, you know, did a study to see just how much uh, the stimulus um, contributed to peak inflation, which was nine percent, and um, they determined that it was around three percentage points of inflation was due to the um, demand increase, and the rest was, you know, due to the supply issues and other factors. So, mm -hmm. if we want to really manage inflation, then, um, you know, we need to, um, you know, if we're, if we're looking to do like a, a smart universal basic income that doesn't exceed our inflation targets, then, you know, you're going to see more inflation. If you do something fully deficit financed, doing something that, um, you know, is, is deficit neutral, thanks to taxes going along with it. So again, taxes help manage inflation and, um, we should utilize that appropriately. And then of course, again, there's other programs. If you cancel some and reduce some, then that also helps um, manage inflation. But people also don't like realize too um, that, you know, competition is like so important to this as well. Um, mm -hmm. As an, like, as a, as an example in Alaska, you know, Alaska is the only place that has had a UBI, um, they still do. They started this in 1982. Uh, it's a small annual UBI of around $1,000, $2,000 per year. But prior to 1982, um, the 
rate of an, the, the the CPI index in Alaska versus the rest of the U.S. as a measured inflation was uh, higher in Alaska. And then after 1982, when the dividend started, then it was lower. And so the hypothesis that it, we should have seen larger, higher inflation in Alaska, it does not bear out. It didn't happen. And instead, what happens is when those mm -hmm. dividend checks go out, you see sales all over Alaska because all the different businesses are competing over those dollars. You know, they want them to spend it at, at you know, I want to spend it at my business. I don't want you to spend it across the street at that other business. So mm -hmm. I'm going to have a sale. And that's another example of how, you know, competition can mean these um, price decreases. And then as another example too, in, in the India UBI pilot, this is, a, this is showing that demand can actually increase supply greater um, so that prices go down. Um, the demand for like fresh fruits and vegetables in India went up because of the universal basic income. And then you had people meeting that demand with supply. Like before there was no one wanting that, but then after that, there was a lot more sellers uh, getting fruits and vegetables into that market. And then, so then because that amount went up, then prices were able to go down. So that's another thing is that, you know, supply isn't static. Supply responds to demand. Uh, it's it's not some non-changeable, movable system. It's that demand and supply react to each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, I mean, now we're going to talk about currency. It brings you to our next uh, issue, cryptocurrency. And I think that's uh, the second hottest topic outside of inflation. And it's replacement of, uh, it's replacement of, I guess our American dollar currency. And I don't think our currencies have been challenged since the Nixon days. You know, I think Nixon kind of took us off the gold standard, put us in a in a circle, uh, can't say that word right now, in a circular pattern that essentially requires us to either, like you said, stated earlier, either put money in to stimulate the economy or take money out by taxation. And this is a big circular pattern that we Kind of how our money functions now. What do you think about this cryptocurrency crave, and how do you think UBI has an impact on it? Um, you know, there's. I think that kind of there's there's more potential for kind of better understanding how how money works through cryptocurrency. Um, you know, a lot of cryptocurrencies use a, a mint and, and burn model, is what it's called. So, you know, you'll you'll mint the currency and you have to figure out some kind of sync in order to delete the currency. Yeah. Uh, and that helps manage the value of the currency. So that's how, again, fiat works. And that's not how people probably understand how fiat works. Uh, again, they think of it kind of more like a gold standard um, where you have to come up with money first. But cryptocurrency helps show that, yeah, you can just create currency. It, it's not necessarily going to have any value because the yeah. value comes from people actually believing it has value. It comes from people actually using it. Um, so I think there's potential for, I think the best potential is kind of local uh, uses. So, you know, where we've seen um, kind of local currencies, uh, I think there's, there's good potential for like local cryptocurrencies, you know, like a, a city could choose to create its own, you know, alternative currency and use a cryptocurrency and then, you know, utilize some function that would help manage um, the supply of that through, you know, some kind of sinks. And um, I think that's, you know, pretty exciting. I would love to see like the first city kind of um, kind of do that. And I think that there's also an option like at the global level. You know, I don't I don't see there being any kind of global UBI without most likely there being some kind of crypto implementation of that you know because other, there's no other really global currency and you're not going to see like you know the un or something issue some kind of global currency it's not going to happen uh what you can do is have this kind of decentralized currency that everyone around the world uses and so that it has value all around the world thanks to everybody using it um and yeah i'm very curious to see if, if something like, like that happens you know like maybe it's something like you know sam altman's world coin uh, or maybe it's something, you know, more decentralized, um, like um, something like you know, proof of humanity or, or um, 
various other um, kind of UBI crypto projects. Yeah. So I, there's two things that I want to touch base with you, but I want to get some of these questions because we have put them in the chat. And it's an, I just want to let you know, some of these questions that I've seen in the chat is most in-depth questions I've seen in our chat. <laughs> um, so you really have people engaged in trying to understand UBI. Um, one of them was, is capitalism turning into a techno feudalism? Uh, you know, a, a, when it comes to, to basic income, you know, something I, I, I really like to reiterate, reiterate over and over again is that basic income is not left or right, it's forward. And so, you know, it's funny how you have those who um, hate capitalism will either love or hate basic income. And also those who, um, you know, love or hate socialism or communism um, will actually either love or hate basic income too, you know? So it's just, it's a really weird kind of policy where, you know, you'll have, um, you know, a, a communist talking about the dangers uh, of basic income and, and helping capitalism. And then you'll have a capitalism or have a capitalist talking about how basic income is a terrible idea because it's communist. Um, there's just like a whole lot of people talking past each other, thanks to like a terrible understanding of basic income and trying to like pin it down. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that that capitalism definitely has issues um, that we're that we're really witnessing, especially right now, and that it will get worse uh, thanks to automation. You know, capitalism has no answer for automation instead of it'll just, you know, eat its own demand. And you can potentially have a whole lot of people as the value of labor, you know, goes down to zero. Um, how do you do that? Like the, the, the impacts of that, you know, impact not just people's, you know, incomes, it impacts democracy. Uh, it means that maybe people are more likely to embrace authoritarian leaders um, and they lose faith in democracy because they just feel that the whole system is failing them. So capitalism is in danger. And I think capitalists need to really think about how to make capitalism work better and work for everyone so that people aren't trying to, you know, dump it and, and, you know, vie for like, you know, violent bloody revolution or something and, and hope for the best. Um, and and I think that um, that also that like socialists and communists and and stuff who maybe really dislike capitalism, um, I think they should see this uh, basic income as being like a step towards post capitalism. Like, how do we actually get to after capitalism, and what does that look like? Um, I, I think that really a step towards that is is decoupling work from income. Uh, to you know, some degree that you're no longer having to work to survive, that you have that basic income floor, and you can actually start looking and enabling some kind of you know gift economies make more sense. Like people are, can actually can actually work for free, um, and they can they can give away things that they produce for free uh, with others who are doing the same thing. Um, that to me kind of peaks at post capitalism. You know, I don't know when we'll be able to get there. I don't know, you know, I, my goal is I, I'd want us to get to something more like Star Trek and, and that being kind of, you know, the post-capitalist vision that I would like to see. And I think if we don't do a basic income, then we're going to, you know, kind of go down the more the road towards like Hunger Games or, or Mad Max instead of Star Trek. And I would really prefer that we don't go that direction. <laughs> Yeah, that would be an interesting world, right? <laughs> uh, so we talked a lot about how UBI um, and, and its effects of it. My biggest thing, and I talk about this every week on the show, is AI and how it's coming to replace our jobs. Uh, I think that UBI is the solution to our AI problem, um, which is, I believe, in, in my opinion, in the next five years, at the rate at which AI is going and the technology is going, there's going to be massive layoffs in our economy. Do you now, do you, I guess, I guess my my question would be, um, what's your timeline? What do you see? How do you predict the future coming forward in the next couple of years? 
first of all, I'd like to say that uh, that it was like the impacts of automation that that brought me to the idea basically in the first place. So it really is kind of a, a common on ramp into the ideas is thinking what happens as a result of automation. Um, but then I also uh, like to point out that the impacts of automation are also already with us. And that's something that I, that I think people don't uh, sufficiently appreciate that uh, we really started seeing these impacts uh, back in the 70s, that um, that all of the growth or virtually all of the growth since the 1970s through computerization, you know, through automation of um, a lot of middle class manufacturing jobs and um, the globalization that technology made possible, um, so much productivity growth happened. And it did not go to everybody. It was not widely shared. Instead, it was concentrated mostly in the hands of the top 1%. So automation is something that is really effective at, at increasing inequality. It's like an inequality generator. Um, we have to actually have policies in place to make sure that automation actually works for all of us um, instead of leaving so many people behind. I think you know one of the reasons why Trump was elected, um, one of the reasons why Brexit happened, one of the reasons why we're seeing a lot of this illiberal uh, response to to democracy and this rise of authoritarianism around the world is because of the impacts of automation. That instead, you know, people are blaming on other things. They're blaming it on immigrants, or they're or they're blaming it on on you know whatever or the other party. You know, but they're they're not blaming on what's actually responsible for this. And that's just the change that automation is doing. Like, it's just what happens as a result of, of automation is that you push down on the, the value of, of human labor. And that's one of the problems too. Like, I, I, we could actually have more automation if human labor wasn't so cheap, you know? Like, mm -hmm. uh, if, it, you see this too when people, you know, they'll, you see like memes where, uh, you know, say, look, this is what the $15 minimum wage did. And you see like a bunch of, you know, the automated McDonald's or you see a bunch of kiosks or whatever. And it's like, you know, somehow a bad thing that we're automating a lot of yeah. these jobs. I think it's a good thing. And, and I think we would already be utilizing the technology we have to automate a lot more stuff if actual, um, if the price of human labor was more accurately priced, like if people could withhold their labor mm -hmm. and say, I'll do that job for $20 an hour. And then the business, um, if the, the equivalent for automating that job is $15 an hour, then they'll automate it. But if someone will work for $10 an hour, there's no reason to automate it. So from that perspective, I think that there's a lot more automating that we could do if we just make sure that people properly benefit from it. And then also people will, embrace technology and also you won't have the pitfalls like you won't have this rising uh, embracing of authoritarianism uh, and for strongman leaders who are promising to help people who are being left behind if you just simply make sure that no one's left behind in the first place that's a great great um, response i mean i think that um with the growth of ai and like you said it just i feel like we have such a aging population, I mean, not obviously baby boomers, but also millennials um, who are kind of in this predicament. They went to school, they got educated to increase their human capital. And now AI is kind of taking that human capital away. And so I think that there's going to be a big gap in terms of how do we re-enter re a new workforce, you know, because AI is a, you know, that's going to, and let me allow the jobs that most people like, for example, you go to school, become paralegal. Um, most lawyers won't need that because they can just tell chat GBT, no, no plug for chat GBT here, but any AI device, some kind of, you know, command prompt, you know, they'll spit out something in two minutes and there, there goes a whole sector of jobs there. So I think that you, I see UBI being a, a kind of a catch all for everybody. Do you ever think that UBI can go into, um, or the government will put classifications on certain UBIs. So like this type of group gets this amount, this group gets this amount. And do you think that's a bad idea or a good idea? 
I don't think that that's a good idea. Uh, I, I think that base income should be seen as this universal, unconditional floor. So everybody receives this and everybody is equal um, through that mechanism. Um, and that's not to say that other programs can exist on top of it. Uh, but I would prefer that, you know, we don't think of other things as like other versions or, or something to basic income, that it's just a, it's a separate program. Again, like disability. So, you know, you want to have a disability program in addition to basic income, um, but that's, it's a supplement. It's not like basic income for those with disabilities. It's that those with disabilities have the same basic income as everyone else. And then we make sure that those with disabilities uh, have this additional program to help them. Um, you know, a, a common question that people ask about is, you know, should we vary this from like, you know, state to state or whatever, uh, to reflect like various costs of living. And that is, uh, I would not recommend that, um, because like one of the great, um, one of the, the great positives, uh, potential impacts of a fully universal basic income is that say, um, those, who are in living in like Manhattan, where costs are really expensive for rent. Um, if they're receiving a thousand dollars a month, then they could stay there if they want, or if they want to spend less of that thousand dollars per month on rent than they would there, they could move to you know rural America and spend a lot less money on rent. And if you vary it, then you lose that ability. You know, suddenly you're subsidizing those um landlords yeah. in like new york city and they know that mm -hmm. they're going to get a lot more money so jack up the rents might as well because it's adjusted for location uh, but that goes away if it's a fully universal amount yeah it's a great topic i wish we had you uh for longer um we one of the things that um and i have stuff you know if you had any more questions um that i wanted to kind of um go into is just do you think that we can have a president that's a populist that can get ubi passed in the next 10 years i think that's important and i also I, I, not only can you have a a, a populist uh, successfully run on on base income i think you could have a moderate successfully run on basic income. I think anyone could actually do that if they just added it to their platform and made sure that people understood it. Uh, because again, this is something that it's real, you know, like people, it, you can, you can promise things like, um, you know, the, the student loan forgiveness, you know, that's like, if you're, if you're a student, if, uh, if you're uh, like, that can help you, um, and hopefully, you know, that can that can win some votes for, for those college debt. And um, those who have who have had their loans forgiven, you know, maybe they're they're more likely to vote for Biden, you know, because of that. Um, then you have people who are upset with that because they didn't enjoy that. And, you know, they you say you you help them and ignored me. Screw you. I'm not going to vote for you. And universal basic income again is universal you can use it for anything it covers everybody so it's like the one thing even aside from you know universal health care is something a lot of people can enjoy but also if people have good health care already if they love their health insurance and their doctors then maybe they'll be worried about that you know they'll be worried well what's gonna happen to my doctor do i have to switch how's this going to impact me and so that's universal but maybe everyone doesn't feel that they universally benefit um but with universal basic income this, it really is a policy where, you know, depending on the design, the tax reforms and changes, um, you're looking to, to do a net boost after taxes to the entire bottom 60 to 90% of the country, regardless of a party, regardless of whether they're a populist mm -hmm. or a moderate, regardless <clears throat> of conservative or progressive or independent. Like, it really is like this unique singular policy that, um, uh, can benefit everybody and it doesn't even necessarily have to have a boost to it too um you know just knowing that it's there means that you have a stronger feeling of security and that's what people don't have right now like there's so much rampant insecurity and it's only going to get worse because of automation you know everyone people are already worried they're going to lose their job at any point 
And then what happens? Can you go, is the safety net going to be there for you? Because it's not there for a lot of people. Um, you know, when, as far as those who are unemployed, uh, only around 30% of the unemployed actually receive unemployment insurance. And you, so same kind of mm. stats exist for program after program where most people just don't get it, even though they technically, you know, should qualify for it or we believe that they should. Um, basic income makes sure that everybody is covered regardless for any reason, no matter what, because it's always there. It's not something people have to apply for. They don't have to jump through hoops for it. And that kind of sense of trust that I think that it shows, you know, it's, it's, it's a politician. It's, um, it's, it's, it's the government saying, I trust you to make your own decisions with this. And that kind of trust, I think, is actually how you make a democracy that, that works better. Um, because if you're trusted, then you're more likely to trust. And we're looking at, a, um, you know, an epidemic of trust erosion um, because of, I think, the lack of this. And instead of leading into these entirely distrustful programs. So um, that was a great answer. I mean, for me, one of the things you said that I, and I forgot to mention, I think it's another common question that a lot of people have is, do we, how do you implement this? Do you do it per check, like we did with the stimulus package, or do we do it as a form of a tax credit that everyone gets every year, um, a lump sum tax credit, similar to what we have with our um, kind of standard deduction personal exemption, but instead of being on the credit side, what do you think is the best way to implement it? One option is certainly to do like we did the enhanced child tax credit in 2021. And the way we did that was that was a fully refundable tax credit and people could choose to either take it at the end of the year or they could get it in advance monthly. So we could do basic income that way and we could use the IRS to do it. Um, it's just that I don't think the IRS is, is best set up for this. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think the coverage is going to be as good as it could be. It's it's doable, um, but you know a lot of people don't file taxes, and then so part of the the CTC was like the communication and letting people know and encouraging people who don't usually file taxes that they can just use this tool and sign up and claim this. And so you know there was a lot of effort that went into that. Um, Social Security I think makes more sense the Social Security system. You know, that already provides uh, monthly income to, you know, tens of millions of Americans every month. Uh, it's, it's very good at it. The uh, administration rate for Social Security, super low. It's a 0.5% overhead on Social Security. Far better than, you know, the IRS tax system. Um, so I that's an option. And we could also just create a, a new department focused only on basic income. Um, that could potentially, you know, be an even better method. Um, it's just, you know, the Social Security Administration already exists, so maybe, you know, that would be the better way. But um, it certainly should be monthly as an option, okay. uh, especially. And then you can argue over, um, you know, the best way to do that. But it certainly should be direct deposits too. And um, another option, this is actually something that especially became a possibility during the pandemic um, was that the Fed could have like created direct accounts for everybody. And then the Fed could issue money directly into that and get it to everybody. Um, this is like a way of making sure that everybody has a bank account, especially the unbanked. Um, you know, part of a good, of a good rollout, I think should involve uh, something like that. And, and maybe even combined with, you know, postal banking too, so that people have like in-person access to these free public bank accounts. And you'd have some competition between, you know, public banks and private banking system. Um, but that's certainly one of the issues is that we want to make sure that everybody has a bank account of some kind that you could electronically direct deposit this money to them. That's the most efficient way possible. And, and I think the, the, the best way. Yeah. Seth, do you have any more questions? No, I don't want to take up too much more of his time. I think that we got pretty much the most in-depth discussion on UBI that we probably could have. I mean, we could probably keep talking, but I don't want to, I don't want to, we already went farther than we expected, but we, we got a lot of great 
yeah, you know, a lot of great answers well. and thought provoking discussions here. So, well, Scott, yeah, there's so much to talk about. Yeah, Scott, we, I hope, I mean, we hope that we have some more free time so we can do a part two of this. Um, I just want to thank you so much for your opportunity to be here. I wonder if you could just talk about your book. Um, what can people buy your book? Where, um, you know, your social media, your social media handle, so we can have that tweeted out. Um, the more, you know, more ways to access you, I guess, <laughs> so that you know, you can yeah, continue. Yeah, yeah. If you want to, if you read, want to read my book, it's uh, "Let There Be Money." You can find it on Amazon, and um, uh, you can find me pretty much on on every social media uh, platform at Scott Santons. And uh, for those on Twitter. Uh, especially, um, I recommend checking out my pinned thread because that's actually where I've been compiling this very long list of the evidence from basic compilers. I'm still continually mm -hmm. updating, so it's uh, I just added the hundredth part to it um, just the other day. So this is now a hundred part thread, just entirely devoted to the studies and the pilots um, around basic income. So if you want to really learn about the evidence base, go to that. And uh, I've also got an FAQ on my blog, and that's at scottsantons.com. All right, guys, you have the information. Make sure you guys get it. Like I said, this upcoming election is very important. And the more insight we have in terms of progressive ideas, the best we can translate that message to the average American and get more people out there to vote mm -hmm. for progressive ideas. So thanks, guys, for you know, coming in and we really appreciate it. Like I said, I'm look, really looking forward to part two and um, I'll see you guys next month, next week. Seth. Great. Thank you. Thank Jesse. you so much. Thanks Seth. All right. I appreciate you guys. Thanks. Absolutely. All right. All right you have a